Welcome to the December 11, 2008 edition of the Open Forum. Once again, we have the privilege and pleasure of looking together into the Word of God uh, to discover truth. My, my, what a wonderful, wonderful book we have to go to. A book that is written by God, so it's absolutely true and trustworthy in all of its original language, and we can even check the translators to make sure that they translated accurately, and normally they have, but once in a great while we do find a verse that they could not translate because they did accurately because they did not have a an idea of what what this verse was really talking about, and in a, and. Uh, uh, that can make a difference in the way it was translated. But anyway, we uh, are at, at a time when God is really giving us truth. The Holy Spirit is opening our eyes to truth after truth. But this is your program. We want to hear from you, your question. And uh, shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, Good evening, Mr. 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 Captain. Yes. Yeah, I got a question about uh, 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 Abel, Abel and, and Cain. So uh, uh, Jesus, uh, I mean, God uh, uh, accept the offering of, uh, of 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 Abel, and uh, because Abel offering. Uh, an orphan to him that was pleased him, and he did not accept uh, the the offering of of kind. Would you explain me why? Because because uh, uh, kind he was he was uh, 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 he was a, he he was walking on the on the garden. You know he was he, you know he wasn't uh, 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 going. Uh, you know. What is your question? So my my question is why did God accept uh, 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 able you know uh, able offering? He did yeah. not accept kind one. Excuse me. Uh, you see, God knows the heart of every human being. He knows, and He knows that Abel brought his offering because he was broken before God. He wanted truly to serve God. And uh, and uh, that this was a very sincere desire on Abel's part to show that he was serving, that he was uh, worshiping the Lord through this offering. On the other hand, God knew the heart of Cain. Remember what Cain said when God told him he would be a, an exile? He says, oh, it's so t- terrible that I'm driven away from the face of the ground. Cain's heart was that he was uh, pleased with this world. He was not, uh, he was just going through a form. He was just uh, going through a, 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 an action, but his heart was not in it at all. And God knew his heart, and therefore his heart offering was not acceptable. As we go on, on into the Bible, we find that God, for example, said to Israel, away with your sacrifices and offerings. They're, uh, they're, they're, they're terrible in my nostrils. I don't want them, or words to that effect. Because he knew that they were putting their trust in their, in their work rather than in the work that Christ had done to make payment for sin. So there's, that's not a bit of, uh, 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 difficult okay, to Mr. Company, what I want you to make clear for me. Let, let's say I am, I am, uh, uh, you know, you, I'm a farmer. I work on the farm, and then uh, some uh, somebody else does. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a like like David. Uh, you know, David was uh, was a uh, 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 a badger. So 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 uh, so I am a farmer. So I offer uh, uh, I, I offer me. to God yeah, so uh, what I have. Excuse me. It was not the kind of offering. A, 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 an offering of a, of a lamb, of course, was a very fine offering. But it's because Abel's heart 
was right with God. The offering of a meal offering would, if Cain's heart was right with before God, that would have been acceptable also. Later on, when we go into Leviticus, we find that some of the sin offerings that were to be offered were meal offerings. So it was not the kind of offering. It was the condition of Cain's heart that was the problem. And it just happened that Abel's offering also was uh, a very fine offering. But hey, if, if Abel's offering was a meal offering, it would have been acceptable to the Lord because his heart was right with God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Mr. Camping, I would like you to read uh, Jeremiah 28, verses 1 through 17, if that's possible. Jeremiah 28, verse 28. Uh, well, I don't want to read 17 verses. What? What? Uh, what is your question? Well, I don't have a question. I have some comments in regard to... Well, uh, 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 is there a verse here that you would particularly want uh, want uh, to, uh, me to read? I don't want to read 17 verses. It's the... Okay. Uh, uh, verse 1 in particular is what I'd like to... Came to pass the same year, the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur... The prophet which was of Gibeon spake unto me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and of the people, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Now this this passage is teaching about the false prophet Hananiah, who is coming sounding like a true prophet. He sounds like a true prophet. He uses the language of a true prophet. But he claims that within two years uh, they would be free from the threat of Babylon because Jeremiah has been correctly telling them as God has, uh, as he is expressing God's uh, words that, that Babylon is finally going to destroy them. And so finally, uh, Hananiah did die. We read in in uh, so in verse 17, so Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month because he was a false prophet. Right now, uh, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, we know that Zedekiah was the last king that sat on the throne of David, and that he reigned ten full years, and then in the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, the uh, city was burnt. And so when it says, and it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, that that fourth year was not the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah. And since it was not the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, it had to be the fourth year in the sabbatical cycle. Now, when we read about the sabbatical cycle... Oh, and, and uh, excuse me, excuse me, I'm not following you at all. And uh, 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 do you have a question? That's that's the purpose of this program, is to answer questions. You are coming with an idea, and you may have some merit in it, but uh, this is not the program to air it, because it, there's no way we can, I can follow that uh, if, uh, quickly enough. We don't. This is not the nature of this program. I'm sorry. And shall we go to our next caller, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Crumpy, good evening. How are you? I'm sorry. Hello. Hello. Oh, well, I'm very well. Thank you, by God's mercy. Thank God. Okay, I have, a, I have uh, something I would like you to give me an explanation on it, for, uh, please. It's Matthew, uh, the 24th chapter. Start on the uh, 42nd verse through... Uh, the 44. Uh, 42 to 44? Yes, sir. There we read, uh, Watch therefore, for uh, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, 
he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. In other words, implying the good man in the house, if he's watching, he can know when the, when that time is. Therefore, ye, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And what we think, what we think he's going to come, that's not what what we're to listen to. We're to watch, and the only place we can watch is in the Word of God. And then, uh, and then we're not going to be surprised. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, when his Lord hath made ruler over his house to give them meat in due season? In other words, the season when Christ is coming, uh, God will also provide the information, the meat of the gospel which he is doing in our day. Now, what is your... Did you have another question about this? No, this is the same problem I have because uh, what I've been confusing there, the Lord said when he will come in, uh, nobody will know about it. But when you spoke about uh, May 21st, about two and a half years ago, I just want to find out if you have any uh, verse a biblical verse you can tell me exactly why, how you get that the Bible, the, the, Bible, the Bible explains that Christ will come as a thief in the night in the night and he explains that all those who are in the spiritual darkness of night time for them they can not know they, Christ will come as a thief in the night. But he's say, speaking about others who, and this is from First Thessalonians chapter 5, he's saying, but ye are not in darkness, ye are of the day, you are of the light. And so he will not come as a thief in the night for them because they're not in the night. But for the those who refuse to keep searching the Bible, refuse to listen to the whole Bible, he will come as a thief because they're still in nighttime. They cannot know. Now, it, it, God, God did not open anybody's eyes to when he would come until we're at that time. It wasn't necessary to let us know ahead of time. But now that we're here, just as he warned the world in Noah's day of the precise day when the flood waters would come, just as he warned in Nineveh in the days of Jonah uh, when the destruction would come, so he has the believers, the true believers here in the world, to warn the world of the precise day. And if you'd like to see how that works out in the Bible, please get a free copy of the book we're almost there, which shows how the Bible teaches this, and you can check for yourself and make your own decision whether that has been done, whether that is altogether faithful to the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping? Yes. I have a question about Hebrews. 3.13 Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 And how does this apply to the since the church age has ended how do we apply this to our daily life? Hey, Hebrews 3.13 But exhort one another daily while it is called today lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin Yes, that's a very fine statement that was very, uh, very uh, necessary throughout the church age because that was God's program, that we are to belong to an organization called the church. It was designed by God. We were to be under the spiritual oversight of elders and deacons. This was God's plan altogether, or God's plan. But, the, unfortunately, the churches have gone spiritually bankrupt. They have uh, salvation plans that are man-made that can get nobody saved. The Bible is not their real authority because they're not ready to listen uh, to anything uh, uh, what we're bringing from just from the Bible. They are 
their authority as their as their creeds or their confessions that that is really what they're serving they're not serving the bible which is the word of god and so god now has come up with another kind of a plan whereby he is teaching directly from the word of god the, those who be, are becoming saved and there's a great multitude that is becoming saved in our day uh, and it, it, it's, it's as we read in Hebrews chapter 8 we're living in that time when he says uh, in verse 10 for this is the covenant that is this is the law that I will make with the house of Israel after those days and that phrase after those days means after the church age is finished, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. In other words, there's no longer going on that we're, that outside of the churches where the true gospel is, are we telling anybody, this is what you have to do to become saved. That's what's going on in the churches. But nobody can tell anyone how to become saved because all the work was done by the Lord Jesus. And, and if we are trusting in anything that we have done to get saved, it absolutely guarantees, the Bible shows this, it guarantees that we're not saved at all. And uh, and so uh, it, it, it we're living in a different day. Now God is laying the truth on the hearts of those that he's saving and we just uh, and these people have an intense desire to be as obedient as possible to be to be uh, faithful to the word of God but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we go to our next call please welcome to open forum hello Mr. Camping yes go ahead please you had a heart surgery done a couple of months ago, right? You had heart... Yes, I had a, a valve repaired a, about six months ago. Yeah. See, I'm a physician. And I realize that why <coughs> are you going for heart surgery? If you know that the end of the world is coming on May the 21st, 2011. Before I had heart surgery? No, but why? You you want to live more than three three years, right? I have. So you went for the heart surgery. So your date of uh, 21st May 2011. <laughs> uh, because if I didn't have heart surgery, I would have died. No, I would not, you I would not, not die. I would not have come to May. Uh, uh, no, I'm a physician. I know what you're doing. I know what you're talking about. Anyway... You, you, excuse me. You did not know what my physical condition was or medical condition was before I had heart surgery. Oh, no. That is not what. We physicians, we know that you are coughing now. Sometimes you cough. You have a very wet lung. Anyway, the other thing which I want to comment is that you have children that which do not follow your philosophy also, right? And I have called up a family radio personally and some of your I think most of your colleagues and all your employees there do not agree to your philosophy of prophecy how do you explain that well because I don't I don't get my children saved God has his elect and he doesn't guarantee that every child and every fa family of a believing parent is one of God's elect uh, that's God's business altogether God has to do the saving. Parents don't get their children saved. Uh, we don't get anybody saved. We, uh, the church might teach you. And I've heard people say, well, you know, I got my dad saved. Now I have a brother and I got to get him saved. That's, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. We don't get anybody saved. And we just, and we can do our best to bring our children up in the fear and in the nurture of the Lord. That doesn't mean they're going to get saved. That's, that it is God who does the saving. Uh, we are simply being obedient as best we can to uh, how we are to bring up our children. 
But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. I'd like to ask you to explain an apparent contradiction between two verses, Ezekiel 18:20. You want to uh, look at Ezekiel 18, verse 20? Yes. There we read Ezekiel 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So, uh, there is there is no contradiction here at all. Right? Well, no, I mean, uh, I want you to compare that to another verse. 1 Corinthians 15.22 First Corinthians 15, verse 22. There we read. Verse 22. For as in Adam all die, and that's our condition. When we come into this world, we are, we are, uh, we, we were all in the loins of Adam. And when he sinned, that brought death, the spiritual death, that is the life of the, de- the life of Christ was dead in every human being, as in Adam all died. So in Christ shall all be made alive. That is, all whom Christ elected to salvation because of Christ making payment for their sins, therefore they, uh, they are made alive. Now, there's but, no contradiction here of any kind. But I, I don't understand. It says in Ezekiel that the Son will not bear the iniquity of the Father, and Adam was our first father. Well, excuse me. The the we were in the loins of Adam because he sinned. We, we uh, that sin we, we're not making paying the penalty for his sin. We that's our sin. We were in principle there in the loins of Adam because we've all come from Adam, even though we had not come into physical, full physical existence. Nevertheless, uh, just like you are a son of your father, you were at one point in the loins of your father. And so we go go to your grandfather, your great-grandfather, keep going all the way back to Adam, and we were there. When he sinned, we sinned. It was our sin, not Adam's sin. I mean, it all began with Adam. But thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Yes. Genesis 24, verse 60. Genesis 24, verse 60. There we read. Genesis 24, verse 60. There we read and... Yes, this is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, where Eliezer has come to get a wife for his master Isaac, who at this time is sixty years old, I believe, and, uh, and wants to have a wife, and 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 so he goes to his in-laws that were uh, way over in another part of the world, and he sends Eliezer, and there he meets Rebecca who is a, 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 a relative of Isaac, and, and asks her that uh, if she will go and be the wife of Isaac. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah, their sister and their nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of, of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And so, what is your question? Oh, I'm sorry. Of million. Shall we go to our next caller? Hello? Please, or, please repeat your question. Hello? Yes? I would like to address the thousands of millions. This would be at least 
two billion. Correct? Uh, yes, but uh, you know, there, you, you have to look at the Hebrew in this, and I did, and I, and I didn't make a note why, but I did cross out the word millions, and uh, and because there was a, a defect in the translation, and you, and and but I'm not qualified to know why I crossed out the word millions, but I did so because it didn't fit the the uh, original Hebrew. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yeah. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, I have a couple of things I want to ask you. Can you tell us when was Christ born? Because a lot of people are thinking that he was born during Christmas. Christ was born, from everything we know from the Bible, on October 2... 7 B.C., which was a, a, a day of atonement that year uh, that, that came in the seventh month and the tenth day of the, of the uh, biblical calendar of that year. Okay. Well, uh, another question. You had a caller that called you last night, and he was talking to you about one of your colleagues that uh, took a loan out to buy, um, uh, I'm not sure, a car or something. And you pretty much told him that uh, that was none of his business because uh, you still have to go on with business as usual, and that was something that your colleague has to uh, take stand. Uh, excuse me. The caller was was very critical of what someone else was doing with his money, and that's not our business to tell someone else what they're to do with their money. That's that's their business. Uh, you know, it's interesting that. I think we'll read somewhere in the Bible, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing in this matter. And and I, I, I certainly don't want to get into a discussion in which I'm going to tell somebody what to do with their money. I don't want to get involved in that, and that's why I didn't want that to continue on this program. But now we have to pause for a message. We're continuing with the program, and shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Hi. My question is, why would uh, Jesus reject the uh, elect of God? And my verses are Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Matthew 10, verse 32 to 33? 32 and 33. Yeah, let's look at that. Matthew 10... Matthew 10, verse 32, there we read, Whatsoever, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Now, what is your question? I, I would, is this implying that Jesus might reject the elect of God? Implying that Jesus would reject uh, the, uh, the elect not. of God? Of course not. Someone who is, is, uh, uh, who is denying Christ... He is someone who is not a child of God. He's not a child of God. Now, to confess be, means be of the same mind with God, and only the true believer is of the same mind with God, and uh, that's why Christ can say, I confess to that person before my Father, which is in heaven. But Christ obviously would never reject the elect because he's already saved them. They were saved before he ever created That is, they were all the work of saving them was done before he ever created the world. All that is left is that at some time in their life he has to uh, give them a new resurrected soul. But uh, the, the, the work of saving them, that was all done before he ever created the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, sir. Yes. I'm calling about Second Peter 2, verse 4. 
Second Peter chapter two, verse four. Let's look at that. Second Peter chapter two, verse four. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now, what is your question? My question is that particular. Uh, meaning for hell, uh, it it means it's a derivative of the Greek noun Tartarus, or a place of torture and torment that's lower than Hades in Greek and Jewish apocalyptic literature. Well, and, uh, uh, just, excuse me, you may, that may be true in Jewish literature, but that isn't what the Bible teaches. Hell is the grave. And remember, it's, it, look at that whole verse. It says they're reserved unto judgment. Now, the evil spirits, there is no death yet of the evil spirits or of of the prince of the devils who is Satan himself. Uh, but they have been reserved. That is, they are guaranteed to die, and they will die uh, on the last day of the day of judgment. But uh, uh, this this. Uh, the word hell. Now, if this, in this case, this may be the word Tartarus. That's possible. There are two or three verses where Tartarus is found, and I, I, I didn't note them in my Bible. But if it is, it still doesn't change the fact that they are reserved unto judgment, and the final judgment is that they are destroyed forevermore. The, the final judgment, as it talks about here, is their death then? Is that the death of the body and the soul? Is that... Uh, no. The, we recognize the, that the body no. dies, but is this talking about the death of the soul then? When a person's body dies, if they're not saved, their soul dies. There's no such a thing as their body dying and not their soul. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That uh, that that's, that's one event. And the... Uh, it's only in the case of the true believers that their body dies, but their soul doesn't die because they had been given eternal life at the moment God applied the Word of God to their life, and they became a child of God. And at the moment of physical death, they simply change residency. They leave their body, and in their soul existence, they go to live and reign with Christ temporarily, until they come on the day of, of the rapture, they come to receive their their uh, resurrected bodies, which uh, are promised them, that they will someday receive bodies that will live forevermore. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, call please? Welcome, Welcome. Reverend Forum. Yeah, hi, Brother Campin. Yes. Yeah, uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, my question is regarding to uh, uh, the Christmas. Why all the whole world knows that Jesus Christ was not born on December 26th, but everybody is celebrating Christmas? Everyone knows Jesus was born when? Or wasn't all born? All the world when? knows that Jesus oh, Christ well, was not because, because, you see... In order to know when he was born, we have to know time. And it was not God's plan to real, reveal very much information about time until our day. So the, throughout the church age, they, they, didn't know, they couldn't figure it out. God did not open their spiritual eyes at all to be able to figure out when he was born. But in our day, we've finally been able to lay out the whole timeline of history, not because we're smarter, but because we're living in this day when we are where every true believer is to no time. And then we discover that it wasn't December 25th or close to that. It was October 2, which was the Day of Atonement. Now, in the meanwhile, the church... Had a, they wanted to celebrate the birth of Christ, and there was nothing wrong about that, because heaven celebrated the birth of Christ. Remember the angels uh, uh, singing to the wise men or to the shepherds, "Glory to God in the highest, 
had on earth peace, goodwill toward men. There was celebration in heaven. So why shouldn't we try to celebrate Christmas? So they just selected a, a day, and, they, and actually that was a very good selection, I, in my, my judgment. It was a day that uh, had been utilized as a as a very pagan a day of some uh, uh, celebrating something very pagan, and it was a day when it, in the northern hemisphere where most people live, uh, the the uh, days now are beginning to lengthen now, and so it was a good, uh, a very fine day to select temporarily, and and uh, uh, or. And in fact, we can continue to celebrate on that day because we only have a couple more for Christmases. I have another question. Uh, uh, I I have some trouble to understand why uh, uh, God has uh, chose uh, Samuel uh, as the king of uh, Israel. Why did God choose what? Why did God, what, what is your question? Would you please repeat it? Oh my, we've lost that call. Shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call is 1-800-322-5385. 1-800-322-5385. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yeah. I was curious if there was a spiritual meaning between the wife of Rebecca, uh, wife of, Mo, um, you know, Rebecca and Leah, being as uh, both of them had a uh, different amount of sons, uh, one blessed more than the other, and then the rivalry between the two. Was there a spiritual meaning between the Rebecca and Leah? Uh uh, I'm not aware. I'm not aware that there's a spiritual meaning. There may be, but I am certainly not aware of it at all. Okay. Um, one, one more. I remember when you were starting to talk about the uh, 200,000 coming uh, from the book of Revelation, that you weren't, when you began, you weren't really with a spiritual number or an, or an actual number. Um, and I missed the program where you explained why you thought it was a actual number. I'm still saying that there. I don't know of any reason, from what I know from the Bible or found in the Bible, why we cannot c- c- consider that to be a factual number. That that is actually the real number of two hundred million. Now. That doesn't mean it absolutely is. I'm not saying that as an absolute fact. It could be understood spiritually, but I don't know of a reason why we cannot understand it as a as a fact. And you know, it ties in with Amos chapter five. Uh, that's uh, that's very interesting uh, how it ties into that because there in verse three we read, uh, "For thus saith." The Lord Jehovah, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred, and that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. In other words, there's about one tenth of those who claim to be believers who actually are believers, and and uh, that that two hundred million is about a tenth of of the number of people living today who uh, claim that they are children of God, is because the World Almanac, this, this isn't a number that comes out of the Bible, but the World Almanac, which uh, is able to uh, uh, figure out, uh, because all the churches keep count, count of how many members they have, that there are about 200, uh, about uh, 2 billion, about 2 billion people who claim to have a relationship with Christ. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Kambi? Hello? Yes, go ahead. Okay. There's a, there's a, uh, Matthew 16, uh, verse 20, verse 13 through 17. Can you please help me on this one? Matthew 16, verse 13. 
there we read, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now what is your question? Uh, the, the last one is uh, verse 8. That's much like this is the way I have the question right there. Well, and then in verse 18, I say unto thee, And thou art Peter, and upon this rock. Now, the word Peter and rock are two different words. They're not the same word. They're very close, but they're different words. And the rock has to do with Christ. This rock uh, that you have, uh, uh, that, uh, the Lord, the, thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is the rock upon which I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, because he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, it means he's not talking about the the, the physical church, the, the local congregations that would spring up all over the world, but he's talking about the eternal church that consists only of true believers. And there, in some churches there are a few true believers, in some churches there are a few more true believers, but uh, the, the local congregations, they are not the eternal church. They, only, they are only a local congregation that is uh, externally representing the kingdom of God, but is not in actuality the kingdom of God. Uh, um, uh, Acts 9, when Jesus uh, get uh, Paul on the, on the street of Damascus, when he persecuted the church, and Jesus said, Thou art persecuted me. So do you have any uh, thing you can tell me about it? Acts 9, what, what verse are you looking at? No, I'm just bringing the Acts 9. I know you would know about it. When Jesus... Well, uh, yeah, well, well, there, why are you persecuted? Why persecutest thou me? We read in verse 4. As far as Saul, as uh, Saul, uh, that was his uh, Jewish name, uh, is going to Damascus to persecute the Christians, and the true believers are. The Bible speaks of us that we are the body of Christ. We're intimately identified with Christ, and that's why he says, "Why has art thou persecuting me?" But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Hi, I have two questions for you. My first question is, uh, is it wrong to meditate because Jesus spent 40 days in the desert meditating and praying to the Father? Is it wrong to meditate? Well, it's never wrong to meditate on the Word of God, but... Uh, uh, the when Christ went into the desert, he did not for forty days. He was not there to be meditate. He was there to be tested of Satan. There was a war going on during those forty days, with Satan desperately trying to overcome Christ, and of course he failed totally. But uh, meditation is not a war. That's a time when we are drawing closer and closer to Christ to his brother camping I read the book we're almost there I'm on the other book now To God Be the Glory and I'd like to know if you can in a short summation show me how the numbers that you got like two is to commission the gospel three is for God's purpose and so on how those numbers those numbers correlate in the Bible with what you say they are because the Bible says that Christ spoke in parables and incidentally Incidentally, the proofs have nothing to do with the number with those, uh, uh, except in one case. There, the, 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 there are a number of proofs that show that, that 
we have arrived at the correct dates for the timing of the end, and that had, except for that one case, had nothing to do with the meaning of the numbers. But we do know that in coming to those dates, uh, that that gave uh, gave uh, internal evidence as we went along that we're on the right track. Okay. And that's because Christ spoke in parables. I see. And, and, brother, and he, for example, he uses the number 1,000 in Revelation 20 uh, definitely as a spiritual number, not as a not as a, 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 a number that uh, that indicates the, uh, a thousand things or a thousand years, literally. And so uh, God gives us evidence that he uses numbers in a spiritual way. And Brother Camping, thank you. I wanted to know also, let's say you always tell your callers that, you know, that's between people about their own business, how they handle money. Hello? I'm sorry, what is your question? We've lost that caller, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping? Yes. Hi. Um, can you tell me, is it true that the virgin birth excluded the male because the sin nature is passed on through the male? We have no idea when the Virgin Mary was born. There isn't the slightest indicator in the Bible that would tell us when. No, I meant the Virgin birth. The, excluded the male because the sin nature is passed through the male. Is that true? Jesus born through... How... how that, that we're talking about an absolute divine mystery, how it could be that God took up residency in the womb of Mary so that he would receive from Mary a human nature and, and be born as a human being. That, that whole business is completely mysterious, but, but uh, Christ, as he, as he demonstrated how he suffered for our sins, I had to do so as a human being, and that was the way that he took on a human nature for that purpose of demonstrating to us uh, how he paid, for, how he suffered for our sins. But thank you for, and this business of that, uh, I've heard theologians talk about the sin is passed through the mail and so on. Forget it. I don't, don't try to understand it. Just, just bear in mind, this is God's business. And we don't have to understand. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Campbell. How are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Um, I would like you to explain for me Mark chapter 13, verse 12. Mark 13, verse 5. 12. Verse 12. Yeah. Mark 13, verse 12. Let me turn to that. There we read, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father, the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. Is that your question? Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what is the meaning of this? I want you to explain that it, um, are those things really going to happen? Well, the fact is that... that uh, when a person becomes a true believer, now remember, here's a family, here's a family, and uh, they, they all, none of them are true believers. They are all uh, in the same kingdom, in the kingdom of Satan, as a matter of fact, and there's harmony between them because they, they have no spiritual disagreement between them. But now one person or two people become truly a child of God. They truly uh, become uh, saved. And so they are taken out of the dominion of Satan under, uh, under his, from under his rule, and they're transferred into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Satan is the bitter foe of Christ. And so now... These one or two individuals who became saved are really the enemy 
of the rest of the family. And God is underscoring that by the language that they can be put to death. That is, they, uh, they, and, and sometimes that has really happened. Uh, I know, uh, there, are, there are some families in the world where if you uh, de- become a child of God, uh, either you have to uh, get out and flee for your life or, or the family says we're going to kill you if you, if you, uh, insist on being a Christian. That literally, uh, has happened in our day. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold? Yes. I, I have a question for you. I, I wanted to uh, just ask you a simple question. Why is it that you have such a personal vendetta against the churches? You know, recently I came about some information, and, and maybe the viewers should hear this. Back in 87, you were in a church, and they forbid you from teaching because they didn't like the, the kind of doctrine that you was teaching in the church. So you were asked to stop, and they asked you to leave the church. Is that the reason why you've been bad about the church? And so, you know... Uh, excuse uh, me, excuse me. Now, I have no personal vendetta against any church. And for years after I was... I had to leave the church in order to remain a teacher. I I was not going around saying bad things against the church. But when we bring the Bible, when we bring the teachings of the Bible, we have to faithfully bring the teachings of the Bible, whether we like it or not. And it's grievous. It's absolutely grievous. I have loved ones who are still in the church. And uh, it breaks my heart that I have to say these things. But that's what the Bible teaches, that the church is now ruled over by Satan. It's not my. It's not an option. If I'm going to faithfully declare the whole counsel of God, that has to be taught. And and uh, I have to warn people that they, the Bible t- teaches that you are to leave your church because they are not faithful to the Word of God. And I and and as. Uh, as I learn more and more from the Bible, I can also know more and more why they are not faithful. And so it's not any kind of a vendetta. There's no joy of any kind when I have to teach that. But There's I no teach. place in the Bible where he states that anyone should leave the church, Harold. There's no place that says the church age is over or that you should get out of the churches. Well, Unless that, you can uh, show me, me a passage uh, in the Bible that says so, I will not take your word for it. Well, for example, we read in Matthew 24, verse 15, where it's talking about our day, the great tribulation time. When you see the abomination of desolation, and that's Satan, standing in the holy place, and the, and the place that is holy throughout the church age are the local congregations because that is where the Bible is. That's, they had been given uh, the mandate to, to send that Bible out into all the world. And, but now we see the abomination of desolation there. And then it says, let those who are in Judea. And that's another word that God is using in speaking about the local congregation. Let them flee to the mountains. The mountains, uh, we know from other parts of the Bible, is a reference to Christ. Let them free, flee to Christ. We read in Revelation 18, verse 4, that, that the churches have, because they are ruled over by Satan, uh, therefore they now are the kingdom of Satan. And God says, you have to get out. Okay? You have to leave the uh, leave the uh, the the uh, uh, Babylon, the, which which is the, a, a name for the kingdom of Satan. Now, because you don't happen to understand those verses or see those verses, that doesn't mean that they are not that that they're not there. They are there, and but and I I wrote. Uh, in fact, if you want to get a copy, it's free of charge. Uh, the end of the church age and after. And there you're going to get a lot of information about that question. But now we have to break for this message. 
Let's take our next call. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Hannah Campion. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay. I have a question, and so does my son. My son is going to go first, okay? He's nine years old. Hold on one second. Hi, Mr. Campion. Yes. Um, 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 Matthew chapter 6, um, verse 22. Matthew 6, verse 22. Let me take a look at that. Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 22. There we read... The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Yeah, now what is your question? Um, what does the eye mean? Well, you see, the, the, the way light comes into our body physically is through our eyes, doesn't it? It doesn't come into our body uh, uh, through our ears or through our mouth, it comes through our eyes that that we see the light. We see the light, and if that now this is spiritually, if we're a true child of God, it means that that uh, our eye. Uh, it, it says, "If there, thine eye be single," that is, if we are if we are faithful to the Lord, and if we are looking only at wanting to please Him, it means that our eye is filled with light. Our whole, our whole being is filled with light. We are not of the darkness. We're, we're of the day. And this is emphasizing, notice verse 23, If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. That is, if with... and You know, what do we look at, for example? Supposing... You were, uh, you were just searching the TV or the internet, if you had access to it, just looking for dirty, rotten programs of one kind or another. That means your eye is evil. And so your whole, your whole, you're full of spiritual darkness. But on the other hand, uh, you, as soon as you see things on your TV or in a magazine or in a book that's Wrong. You turn it off. You don't want to listen anymore. That's because you light. You want only good things to come into your into your uh, into your mind. But thank you. Wait, wait, um, wait, wait. My mom wants to um tell you something. Hello. Yes. Okay, I have a question. Matthew twenty two, uh, verse ten. Matthew twenty two, verse ten. Matthew 22, verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. What, what does bad and good mean? Well, it means that there are... This is from man's vantage point. Uh, when God saves us, there. let me give you... Uh, 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 two illustrations. First of all, here is the rich young ruler. Remember him that came uh, and addressed Christ as a rabbi, good master. Uh, what must I do to have eternal life? And he was a good man. He kept all the laws, but he still was not saved. And yet Christ loved him, we read, and so it means that it was God's intention to make him his child also. That's the good. On the other hand, here we look at, at Christ hanging on the cross and next to him is an evil criminal uh, who is being crucified, uh, who is being uh, put to death for his, for his crimes. Uh, and, uh, and he too is, becomes a child of God. So you have uh, the very very good person who needs desperately needs a savior you have a very wicked person who desperately needs a savior and Christ saves both kinds thank you so much Harold Camp and thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum 
welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Mr. Campaign, I just want yeah, to... Yes, go ahead with your call. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, um, first, I just would like to know, for all of us, how would you like to be addressed? Would it be Brother, Mr., or Harold Camping? Do you have how a preference? How should we address you? You can address me as Brother Camping, as uh, by my first name, Harold, or you can uh, just say, Hey there. Uh, I, uh, you don't have, uh, uh, at least whatever you do, don't don't give me any titles or anything because uh, I I want none of that. Well, that's very generous. Um, second, um, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing with us what God has opened your heart and your eyes to the Bible for. I don't know where I would be without your teachings. Thank you, sir. And finally, uh, this evening's call, Mark twelve thirteen, has touched my heart immensely because I've been estranged um, from my family because. They all think I'm kind of nuts. Mark 13. Uh, okay, and which verse? Uh, that was this evening, Mark 12, 12, sir, 12, 13. Uh, incidentally, did you call earlier in the program? Uh, no, sir. I was listening to um, someone else who called, and that <clears throat> you explained that oh. that was very touching because I, I've been estranged from my family. Because oh, okay. I do believe, sir. Uh, uh, Mark 12, verse 13, we read, And they, that is the Pharisees, sent certain of, under him, certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. In other words, uh, Satan was working in the hearts of these Pharisees trying to cause Jesus to make a misstatement so that he would be guilty of sin. And they kept after him and kept after him. Now, uh, what is your question about this verse? <clears throat> uh, oh, th there is no question. I just, again, my call is just to thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. At the camping? Yes. Hi, this is, I'm calling from Daly City. I have a question in regards to, um, you know how Jesus did, died when I mean, he paid for our sin before the foundation, and at the second time he came to demonstrate to die for us? So if he, my, my question is that um, if he already paid for our sins before the foundation, did he pay the, the, did he pay the same way when he when he Did he pay the same Way, well, the payment came through death, because the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So before he ever became the creator, he had to be laden with the sins of those that he planned to save, and then he had to die. Now, how that was accomplished, we don't know. That is absolutely. Uh, a mystery to us how that could happen. But because he have actually died, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell that is in the grave, uh, that is, he rose again. Now he could be called the Son of God. He had a new beginning, even though he is from everlasting past. In another sense, he had no new beginning. But because he died, he died as a whole personality. That's a, a, an absolutely divine mystery uh, and therefore he he uh, uh, now could be called my only begotten son and when he came to demonstrate how how he suffered he of course did not pay for sins all over again but he he demonstrated enough so that we see him uh, become shamed grow terribly shamed we see him suffering we see him uh, that he died, his body is put in the grave, it's, uh, but not his soul. No, that, he couldn't have his soul put in the grave because he, uh, the, he's not really paying for it since he's only demonstrating uh, to show us that he did die and rose again. But thank you for, call, call, for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, 
Jeremiah chapter 3, uh, verse 23. And how does that relate to Matthew twenty four sixteen? Matthew twenty four sixteen. we read, uh, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Okay? And... And the other one is Jeremiah three twenty three. Jeremiah three. Jeremiah three twenty three. There we read uh, truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. Um, well, it, you see, it depends on the context. Now, for example, we read in Psalm 121, To the hills or to the mountains I will lift up mine eyes from whence cometh my help. So that at times the mountains are a, a figure that is pointing to Christ as our Savior. But on the other hand, the word mountains can be used in reference to something else, like uh, like uh, uh, the the uh, ten horns represent seven um, uh, se- seven mountains, and uh, in that case, it's something different altogether. So we have to look at the context. What is the context? I'm sorry. What is the context of Jeremiah? Well, the context is that. That uh, in uh, in uh, 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 return ye backsliding children, verse twenty two, and I will heal your backsliding. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art Jehovah our God. Uh, truly, is, for shame hath devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion. Cover us, for we have sinned against the Lord our God. And the context would indicate that they are are looking in the wrong place uh, to find that God is not using the mountains here spiritually to indicate Christ, because there is the, there the context shows that it's not that as they look to the mountains they are not receiving any help. If the mountains were referring to Christ, then then they would be saying that they are receiving help, but they're not receiving help. So the mountains have to refer uh, to something that is uh, different than salvation. All right. Revelation 16, verse 20, if you could. Revelation 16, verse 20. Revelation 16, verse 20. There we read... And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Now, in this case, it is is simply talking about the end, the uh, physically the end of the world, that the that the the continents are gone, the mountains were not found. It is the it is the fact that the whole earth is being destroyed. The mountains can't be uh, Christ not being found. I'm sorry. The mountains can't uh, relate to Christ not being able to be found. Well, it, it's conceivable, but the, but it, uh, when it talks about every island fled away, uh, that uh, that's talking about something physical. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, uh, and so on. I uh, it it's conceivable it might have an illusion or uh, something. To do with salvation, but but uh, yes, it's, it's possible. It's possible because it could be a parable, right? Uh, at least that part of the verse could be a parable. Okay, thank you, Mister. Thank you for calling and sharing. And thank shall you. we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Hey, brother Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. I just had a question. Um, I had three questions. I'll make it fast. My first question was about Malachi 3.10 where it talks about tithing, paying your tithes to a church or congregation because the church I currently attend, um, besides listening to family radio, the pastor's constantly talking about paying tithes and if you don't 
pay your tithes, you're guaranteed to go to hell. And um, well, I just course. want to know your view on that. Well, the, first of all, why are you in a church when when Satan rules there? But even during the church age, pastors always talked about tithing, even though the New Testament doesn't talk about tithing. It says that God wants everything, like we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, the, the, the tithe was used in the Old Testament as a picture of sending out the gospel that would bring in believers into the kingdom of God. Most of the people in the Old Testament were farmers, and they would take a tenth. They were commanded to take a tenth of their crops that came in, the increase from their seed, and bring that to the temple treasury to support the priesthood of that day. And that was a picture of the fact that as we send out the gospel, remember Jesus gave, it was one of his first parables, the sower went forth to sow, the seed was the word of God, and the uh, the ground that it was uh, cast into was the hearts of men, and it would bring forth uh, some thirtyfold, some fiftyfold, and so on. Uh, that was the, the increase, and and that was the tithe that came back into the kingdom of God. So the whole purpose of tithing was was centered around the fact that we are to faithfully send the gospel out in order that there might be a harvest of souls because it requires the the hearing of the gospel for uh, to be the environment in which God is saving but the churches they have uh, they, they, that's not their concern their concern first of all is having a beautiful sanctuary of paying the pastor plenty of money or being able to pay a pastor sufficient money so they can get a high-class pastor of some kind and so on. But really, the the idea of tithing is in order to bring in those who are true believers. Now, there are churches that did have a fairly good mission program, but they were fairly rare. And and actually, that should have been the number one priority of the church. But uh, uh, in our day, of course, the church has no true gospel. They're ruled over by Satan, and so you wouldn't, whatever you did, you wouldn't want to support that kind of a gospel at all. But that th- thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Hello, hello, hello. Well, yes, welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Bob, oh, Kevin, oh, I, I, I want to ask you a question. Um, you know, I've been talking to people. Uh, I want to know any scripture, like in the, in the Old Testament or, or wherever, where, um, you know, when God was, like, destroying the earth, you know what I'm saying? Like, like I view the God in the Old Testament like, like, a, like, a, like a vengeful God. When, you know, when man did things, he would destroy the earth. Did, did, like, did Jesus, like, like, or he wasn't like Jesus in the Old Testament, but did God had like a conscience that was telling him to, you know, let me come down and, and like to redeem the earth? Because we know like God in the Old Testament was one. Well, we do have plenty of passages that indicate that the, uh, the whole world is under the wrath of God. Like, for example, Jeremiah 25 is uh, that chapter says it very, very plainly. He says in in uh, Jeremiah 25, and uh, we read there, uh, and it's talking about, uh, then, verse 17, Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand, and made all the nations to drink, unto whom Jehovah had sent me. And it lists a whole series of nations, and finally says, In verse 26, And all the kings of the earth, of the north, far and near, one uh, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak, that Satan shall drink after them. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith Jehovah, host, the God of Israel, Drink, 
and be drunken and vomit and fall and rise no more because of the sword I will send thee and uh, uh, that kind of language is found in the Bible that you know that there will be our complete destruction the best passage of course that really uh, gives more detail is Second Peter Second Peter where uh, uh, chapter 3 where uh, uh, I think it's I think it's Second Peter let me turn to make sure in uh, in uh, yes Second Peter chapter 3 where it says where it says uh the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men and then in verse 10 the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise the elements shall melt with fervent heat the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up in Isaiah it reminds me that in Isaiah 65 we read let me go back to that and there uh, in verse 17 for behold I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine in other words it will be gone but thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Kempen? Yes. Yeah, good evening, Brother Kempen. Um, looking at Revelation 18, in the verse 3, where he talks about the kings of the earth committed yes. fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth committed uh, wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. How do you look at that with verse 9 and verse 11? And I'll take that off the air. How does this relate to verse 9 and 11? 11. Yeah, I'll take it out there. Well, let's look. Let's see now. Thank you. In verse 2, we read, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, this angel, <laughs> saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth and when it talks about kings it's not just the king that's in view it's the whole all the people of that kingdom have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth uh, uh, were waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies and then finally in verse 9 it says and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And it, it relates totally. In other words, the kings of the earth that are carrying on the way we're reading it here are all of the peoples of the earth who are of the various nations as we read in Jeremiah 25, that every nation and, and uh, everyone will come under the judgment of God. But you know, the, 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 the one truth that shines through here in Revelation 18, amongst others, is that man's hope, mankind's joy, mankind's future is in this earth. This is where the glamour is. This is where I pursue my career. This is where I, I can gain riches. This is where I can enjoy a very fine living of some kind. And when they come into the day of judgment and all they see is death all around and, and buildings destroyed by this huge earthquake and and they know it's the end. It is going to be a time of great sorrow. Great sorrow. Because they'll know this earth is finished. They can never, never have any joy from it. And eventually, they too will die. But shall we take our last call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camden? 
Hello. Hello. Mr. Campion? <laughs> yes, go ahead. My name is Yvette Swaby, and I would like to ask you to read Matthew chapter 24, verses 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. 36, yes. Let's turn to that. Matthew 24, verse 36. We read, But of that day and hour knoweth no one, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, the fact is that... I'm Matthew chapter 25, verses 13. Matthew 25, verse 13. Yes. There we read, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. And there's nobody who knows that of themselves. Oh, yes, Mr. Campion. Mr. Campion. Yes, what How is How your... come you tell me about that Jesus is coming in the year 2011? And nobody know, and you know the date and the day and the hour. How you know that? That's not written in the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. You notice what it says here. Nobody knows the day or the hour. But no, it does, excuse how do you me, know excuse that? Excuse me. Excuse me. But it doesn't say that nobody can know the day or the hour. It's just like the Bible says in Romans 3. Nobody, there's none righteous. No, not Mr. one. Campion. Excuse me. Excuse you me. Know. Excuse me. But the fact is that that doesn't mean we cannot become righteous. And it is a fact that anybody, particularly in the churches, are going to be teaching Christ comes as a thief in the night because the night has to do with the character of those who are in the churches. They're still in spiritual nighttime. And God does not give them the date. They don't want to know the date and and they'll never learn the time. But outside of them, uh, the churches, there are true believers who are watching and who do know the time. Now we've come to the end of our time. I'm sorry. We can't visit longer. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you.